Hey, Duquesne student athletes, this is Jeff Lucchino um, coming to you from my home here in Pittsburgh. I hope you all staying well on campus and staying safe. I really wanted to discuss about um, a topic that comes up a lot in conversations, uh, special diets. You know, should I be on a keto diet? Should I be doing intermittent fasting? Should I be doing low carb, high carb? You know, you know, is there something out there that I'm missing? And the answer to that is simply no. You know, most diets, they sound too good to be true and they honestly are too good to be true. So what I wanna to do today is kind of take a deep dive into some, you know, kind of facts and myths about some certain diets out there, plant-based, intermittent fasting, keto, et cetera, and talk about some pros and cons, uh, a lot more cons and pros, but let's take a deep dive and talk about that. So on the agenda side, what we're gonna talk about is obviously special diets and we're talking about the overview of special populations know which populations I'm referring to as far as special diets go, um, what populations should be on a special diet and why. So we'll kind of touch on that. Talk about keto, talk about plant-based, talk about intermittent fasting. I'll go over each of these and kind of talk about what they are and, and what population they're actually somewhat effective for, but I'll take a deeper dive into each one of those. So special populations. Um, it's simply an individual or athlete that has a special dietary need whether it be an allergy or let's say a health condition or genetically, or maybe just some sort of diagnosis that says you have to be on this certain type of diet. Um, diabetics are a perfect example. You know, they really have to watch their blood sugar. So they're gonna be on more of a diabetic friendly diet that emphasizes more lean proteins, whole grain carbohydrates, really limiting those quick sugars. Um, so they have to be more on kind of a, a regimented approach rather than just eating throughout the day they cannot do that because their blood sugar would be fluctuating all the time. They want to have a stable blood sugar. So, you know, that's, that's a special population right there. Other common ones are going to be anyone who has high cholesterol, triglycerides, you know, any blood lipid panels that show, you know, either hyper or hypo even. I mean, hypo is good, but hyper um, is where you want to decrease those. So that will be maybe less saturated fat or less triglycerides in the diet um, or less of a specific you know, a uh, nutrient that is causing these to flux um, in the hyper range. So those are kind of some special populations that have a medical diagnosis reason of why they should be limiting or increasing or revising what they're doing. So what about special athlete populations? You know, so if I'm an athlete that is looking to change body comp, or if I'm looking to prepare for a big competition, or, you know, if I'm pre-op or post-op, if I'm having a acute injury risk or injury, uh, reoccurring injury that's acute or chronic, you know, if, or if I'm just overreaching, if I'm training a little bit too much, you know, these are special populations that don't require a special diet, but they require some revisions in what they're doing. So again, special populations that are medical diagnoses should be in a, a one group, one box, and special populations in the athletic population should be in another box. Um, they shouldn't cross over too much unless there is a reason to cross over, such as an athlete who maybe needs to change body comp and has type 2 diabetes, they would kind of mesh together. But my point being is that if you're an athlete that just is looking to tweak some things, get ready for competition or season, that's no reason to be on a special diet. That just means we want to take the basics and we want to revise the basics. We want to maybe just substitute some things out that are very simply such as you know, maybe a lateral swap or maybe, hey, too much of this, let's add more of that. You know, could be an athlete that wants to lose a little body fat. They're consuming, consuming way too much saturated and trans fat, maybe at lunchtime. And instead of the burger and fries, we swap that out for grilled chicken and some brown rice. So that will be a, a situation that's special, but not diagnosis special. All right, so let's talk about some of the specific diets. So one is keto. So, you know, a lot of questions are asked about keto. Is it good? Should I be doing it? What's it all about? You know, so let's take a dive in there and talk more about that. So keto, to put simply, back in the early 1900s was proven effective for patients with epilepsy, seizures. Um, still to this day is used in a clinical setting for anyone, adolescents, child, um, adults that have seizure risks or have diagnosis of epilepsy. Um, the keto diet is very viable. Um, it's valuable because the brain activity, it slows down the brain activity, it slows it down a little bit. So 
there's not a high risk of seizures and a high risk of blood sugar fluctuations, which you know can affect the brain. Um, and so that special population that has a diagnosis behind it, there is viable reasons of why carbohydrates should be very minimal and fat should be increased. Uh, and in the second bullet point, you can see it's pretty much a very high fat diet. 80% of the diet is fat. And then you're going to have a very small amount, 5% or less carbs, like 40 grams or less carbs, and then 15, 20% protein. So kind of a more of a moderate protein intake. So the claim for this diet that everyone's saying, this is why you should be on a diet if you don't have epilepsy, just an athlete who wants to perform at a better level, basically saying that this is going to reduce blood sugar fluctuations um, and blood sugar fluctuations will prompt overeating. So keto can reduce those. So there's no risk of overeating. And also a higher fat diet is better for blood sugar control and for weight loss and for satiety, kind of feeling full. So gr sounds great. Sounds great on paper. Like, hey, this is a diet that's going to do all these things. No more crashing. You're going to have sustained energy. Great. But we know from a science side that our muscles need glycogen. Our brain needs carbohydrates. And in order to perform high intense bouts of activity, we need these things. We need those macronutrients. And depriving the body of that all of a sudden changes the whole scope of what the body's been getting for 18, 19, 20 years. So sounds great. And I've had a lot of athletes kind of try it, but the end result is usually hypoglycemia sometimes, or it's, I crash a lot. I bonk a lot. I feel so sluggish and tired after a couple of weeks of doing this. I have brain fog. Main reasons is that the body needs carbohydrates. You know, so the primary energy source when we train is going to be glycogen, glucose, carbohydrates, um, especially during those high intensity bouts. Second thing is, you know, fatty acids, triglycerides, you know, coming from food sources or stored. And by the way, we have a ton of stored fat that we use throughout the day. We have a ton of it. We have tens of thousands of calories worth of it. But at the same time, the conversion rate from internal energy storage to energy we can use throughout the day, it's a very slow conversion which is why athletes in the bodies of athletes favor carbohydrates because the transition from storage to usable is very quick. So that's one of the main reasons why the keto diet sounds great, but when you dig into it, you think of just practically, is it going to work or not? That's one of the practical bullet points I tell athletes is that it's not a very fast usable energy so source when you're getting a high fat diet. So it makes more sense, carbs, fast energy source, high intensity bouts of activity. It's the most kind of simplistic way to approach athletics, uh, especially during training and competition. And a high fat diet may prompt some GI issues. You know, if you ever consumed anything very greasy, fatty, I mean, you don't feel the best afterwards. Uh, and this diet obviously is not saying eat pizza and fried food all day long, but it's definitely promoting high fat foods. And high fat foods could affect the gut, could result in some stress in the gut, and could result in you know, some GI issues. And that could be anything from diarrhea to constipation to just an unsettled gut. It could also affect the microbiome, the bacteria ratio of the gut as well. So we always want to watch, you know, not just how it's going to affect our performance, but how is it just going to affect digestion and absorption of nutrients. Here's an example day. I just gave three example meals. You know, it sounds great for a couple days of eating, you know, scrambled eggs and butter and you know, chives and cheese, you know, again, protein, fat, et cetera, you know, salmon, great source of protein. You have it in coconut cream for the extra fat. And then after dinner, you got fried chicken and broccoli with sour cream dressing. I mean, it all sounds great, but again, practically, is this going to be kind of your everyday kind of meal plan? It, it, it sounds great for a couple of days, but in the end, you know, where are the carbs? Why aren't they there? Especially for an athlete, you've been having carbs throughout your entire, entire athletic career so far. And at this point, it's like, why change things? You know, don't look at, oh, carbs, the reason I'm not performing well. Look at your sleep. You know, look at, are you eating on a good schedule every day? Are you training really well? Are you hydrating really well? Look at the basic practical things that are in front of you every single day. A diet change is not the answer. In most cases, 90% plus, in my opinion, it's not the answer. All right, so let's transition out of keto and talk about more of a plant-based. Now, if you've seen some documentaries on Netflix, The Game Changer, um, you know, articles about plant-based over meat-based and saying plant is more natural, higher in this, antioxidants, phytochemicals, you know, yeah, plant, plant foods are higher in those things. But again, the sticking point is that what nutrients do they lack? 
because obviously you can't just eat plants and plant foods all day long and get everything you need. Meats do have a lot of benefits. So we'll talk more about that as we go through some slides here of why not just plant-based purely is the way to go, why you wanna mesh the two together. And the only reason that you wanna to stick to a plant-based only is if you're a vegan, vegetarian, you're adamant about being plant-based, maybe there's a medical diagnosis around that too as well. You know, again, you can do that, you can do that really well, but it has to be more planned out and there is gonna be more of a preparation element to plant-based over kind of a, just a general Western diet. Great athlete, Carl Lewis, you know, he was one of the, one of the first vegan athletes out there. Um, the one thing I'll point out about any athlete who's vegan and that excels at a high level, they're genetically gifted. So don't look at one of the best athletes in their respective sport and they're plant-based and you say, wow, I should be plant-based because he or she is plant-based. That would make me a better athlete. Not necessarily. You have to look at the athlete. You have to look at genetics of that athlete. That athlete could probably do whatever they want from a dietary side within reason and probably still perform at a very, very, very high level. Many professional athletes eat a lot of fast food. Um, and, you're, and you're looking at yourself and you're like, well, I don't eat fast food and my performance is improving, but nowhere near professional level. A lot of that has to do with genetics and a lot of that has to do with just their, this, this, their ability and their training and everything that they've been coached up on. They have many more years of experience as well in most cases. So it's not an apples to apples comparison. So plant-based, you know, what is that definition? You know, it's basically various forms of plant-based diets. There's various forms out there, but it's basically trying to get all your nutritional needs from plant-based sources, reducing or eliminating animal-based whatsoever. So there's five different kinds. There's a vegetarian, there's vegan, there's lacto-ovo, there's lacto, there's pescatarian. You know, not one size fits all here. You know, I've had every, I've had athletes that fit in each category or crossover sometimes. Uh, I would say the most common is going to be your vegetarian. That does include the dairy and eggs, but it's strictly more plant-based. Um, so yeah, it kind of crosses over depending on the athlete. Vegetarian diet. So let's talk about that. Most common um, does not include any animal protein. What are, the biggest question I get is what are the macro micronutrient deficiencies in a vegetarian diet? So number one is protein. Um, Protein is definitely, again, plant-based sources such as beans, lentils, chickpeas, nuts, seeds, soy, all great sources of protein. But again, a lot of athletes don't have these available in their cafeteria or don't know how to shop for these or make these or the time to make these, I should say. Um, so protein sometimes can be lacking, especially in a vegetarian diet. Complete proteins is another category. That basically is a protein that has all the essential and non-essential amino acids involved. Um, in a lot of cases for a vegetarian athlete, they have to mesh two proteins together to make a complete protein. For a Western diet or like an animal-based diet, typically you just have chicken or beef, you know, and that would be a complete protein. They have all the amino acids that you need, so there's no combining, there's just one. And so you have a little bit of a, a negative there with plant-based, but again, if you have done this for a while, you schedule things the right way, have some combinations, you can get your complete proteins very easily, but it does take time, a little more preparation and thought too. B12, excellent B vitamin, um, helps in just natural energy production, takes a lot of the foods you're consuming and produces natural energy from those foods. The one thing is that, you know, vegetarian diets do lack B12. So I do always recommend that if you're a vegetarian, you should probably supplement B12 and, and get a quality NSF third-party certified B12 supplement. And iron's another one. Iron and complete proteins are kind of almost the same type of discussion. You know, hemi iron is found in animal-based foods. Hemi iron absorbs a lot better than non-hemi iron, and non-hemi is your plant-based type of protein, um, or iron, I should say. So again, the absorption is going to be a little bit less in the plant-based on the iron side. And so if someone is anemic, has very low iron levels, and is plant-based, a lot of times you're going to have to supplement with iron um, from like a ferrous sulfate to get sufficient amounts of iron in the body. And iron is very important for oxygen production. Um, it helps the muscles basically repair, recover, and get enough oxygen they need, especially during bouts of intense activity. What about plant-based protein powders? If you're that type of athlete that is on a plant-based diet and you're saying, hey, it's so hard to get the protein from the foods from just convenience and planning, what about powders? 
So number one, let me answer some questions here. Are they safe? They're safe, but you always want to look for a third party tested NSF certified product. And I'll show you a visual of that, what it looks like on a later slide. Do they provide the same benefits as whey? In most cases, they do not. Whey is a, again, a complete protein. It's going to have a high amount of leucine, which is a branched chain amino acid that helps in protein synthesis. Plant-based proteins do lack the amount of leucine compared to whey. And whey is typically better absorbed than plant. And a lot of research has been backed up, backs up whey as a more a higher end protein source than plant-based when it comes to recovery as well. And are they necessary? You know, that's a question I get a lot. Do I need one? You know, if I look over a student athlete's dietary intake and I feel their protein intake is sufficient, you don't need one. Is it helpful? Yeah, it could definitely be helpful, especially when you're in season and have a tough time getting your calories and protein and recovery in, but it's not necessary right out of the gate. And the benefits, you know, of protein powders, uh, of plant-based protein powders, again, if you're an athlete, older adult, cancer patient, you know, lung disease, et cetera, I mean, it's definitely beneficial for some of these populations to get a protein powder. It's not the most immediate thing you should throw in, but it's definitely something I would say to think about and consider and talk to your sports dietitian about. This is the documentary that I was referring to uh, before. It's called Game Changers. I'm not going to run the YouTube clip, obviously, on, on, the, on the recording here, but you can click on that YouTube clip. Um, it gives you some great insight on what the documentary is all about. If you do have uh, the availability of Netflix, it's a good watch, but a lot of pseudoscience in it. A lot of the claims they make are false and aren't justified through research. They're justified by biased opinions. So just understand that before you watch it. And then just going off the plant protein powders, what are the drawbacks? You know, it could be at a high cost, possible contamination, high concentrations of phytates, which are found in a lot of common plant-based foods. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's some drawbacks to this, low dose of leucine, which I said before. There's some drawbacks, but again, it's, it's something that you wanna to talk to your sports RD about. And here's the one I would recommend. Um, Garden of Life, high quality brand. You see the NSF, NSF certification. The best forms of uh, a plant-based protein powder are gonna be from a pea-based and from a soy-based. Um, Pea is more commonly used nowadays, I think because of the negative perception of soy. Um, you know, the negative, I would say, feedback I get from pea is the taste sometimes, the gut feel. But other than that, it's a very high concentrated form of protein. And um, one thing to consider, it's not complete. Um, it only has half the methanone levels, so you do need to, you know, not maybe add something to it. You could do a soy milk with it to make it complete. You could always do that. But if you're having, let's say, water and a scoop of this, you know, after your workout, after your training session, you know, it's not the end of the world if you don't get a complete protein there. It's not a meal. I prefer athletes who are plant-based to try to get complete proteins at a meal more than trying to get them at snacks. Just, just more, it's easier to do so. You have more options available at a meal. You can think more clearly. You're not on the go. Um, so it, it's, it's not the end of the world if you don't get a complete protein right after you're done working out. That's why, again, whey is better, especially if you're kind of deciding plant or whey, go with whey, especially from a post-workout recovery side. Okay, let's talk about the last one, intermittent fasting. Um, this one, I've seen it all. I've seen someone do a 23-hour fast in a one-hour eating window. The most common type is a 16-hour fast in an eight-hour eating window. There's really not a population that I've seen that can really benefit from this. Um, I think maybe the only little caveat there is that, you know, if someone is having difficulty with structure of eating and not an athlete, more of a general population person works eight hours a day, you know, at a desk job, very low activity, there could be some benefits to having more of a structured window, like say, okay, breakfast is at eight. My last meal is going to be at four and then I'll cut everything off after that. So, you know, maybe someone could pull that off, especially now since they're working from home, they can maybe squeeze in that early dinner at four and then be done by four, be done by four, 430, and then have that eight hour window of eating, 16 hour fast. But again, for athletes, you know as well as I do, your training times, your practice times, your competition times are all gonna vary. So if you are fasting during the time that you are training, you can't eat before, you can't eat after, that can result in some, some serious issues, especially if the train's intense, 
in an environment that's you know high high heat, high humidity, you're losing a lot of water, a lot of nutrients, not something you want to entertain or do. So again, the overview of this is basically it was termed the warrior diet uh, early on and very popular among bodybuilders and fitness competitors. Um, reason being is because again, structure, you know, you're not eating past a certain time, you know, you're, you're, you're basically just having this many calories over this course of the day and then you're done. There's no spontaneous eating, if you will. Um, those populations, bodybuilders and fitness competitors, the main goal there is to get as low body fat percentage and maintain as much muscle as possible, especially before competition. That is not the goal of a student athlete um, at the division one level. The goal of a student athlete at division one level is to compete at the highest level possible um, and reduce the risk of injury among other things. But so strongly consider that the populations that are doing this are completely the opposite of a student athlete. Um, again, the main premise of the intermittent fasting diet is basically having a window of eight hours you're gonna eat and a 16 hour window you're gonna fast. And the whole idea of this is that, okay, 16 hours of no eating, eight hours of eating, I'm giving myself structure, I'm reducing late night snacking. Probably someone who's eating a lot of snacks late night or snacks throughout the day and they all of a sudden do this, they're probably gonna see some weight loss over time, but long-term effective, long-term sustainable. And again, student athlete, absolutely not. But from a general person, Again, just give yourself structure. You don't need to do intermittent fasting to lose weight or reduce caloric intake. So obviously, can athletes benefit from this diet? The answer is absolutely not. They cannot benefit from this diet at all. So many reasons why athletes won't. Kind of mentioned these before, but again, you know, it takes longer time than just eight hours to get all your macro and micronutrients in, especially for an athlete that might have a morning lift in an afternoon or late night practice. You just, you can't pull this off and it's not wise to even try. Um, and that's the second point right there. And then research has not backed the intermittent fasting diet up when it comes to performance, recovery, or anything related to an athlete. So I personally, and every sports dietitian that represents a university will see the same thing. I look for research. I want to see research on something that I recommend to an athlete that has um, viable results that says, okay, this could be may be beneficial for this population or this individual athlete or this team. Um, so yeah, I mean, you really don't wanna go off something over maybe, oh, it sounds good, CrossFitters are doing it or bodybuilders are doing it. So yeah, it's gonna work on a student athlete. Probably not, and, and definitely not actually. Uh, when you think about an athlete, you think about their training schedule, you think about academics, you think about just everything that goes into competition day, you know, it, an intermittent fasting diet especially diet alone, is just not an effective tool for elevating performance. Guys, here's my contact info. Um, if you have any questions on this presentation, please let me know. And if you have um, any dietary needs, whether it's, you know, you have some questions about a meal, a snack, your schedule, your day, um, your, your eating windows, your hydration, your supplement intake, please contact me. Um, you can set up a one-on-one -on -one consult virtually, do a Zoom call, go over things, talk about things, answer any questions you guys have. So again, hope you guys stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll talk to you soon.